Hey guys, on this episode of Another Dungeons Learn to Play, we're going to be playing the game Takedo. It's one of my favourite games, not necessarily because it's particularly complicated or um, deep or involved or whatever. It, there's a lot to it, but it's very simple to learn. It's, it's enjoyable enough that I can play it with my adult friends and uh, simple enough that I can play it and enjoy it with my uh, children as well. Mainly the six-year-old and the nine-year-old, younger than six. I don't know if anyone else's kids are like this, but mine tend to not pay attention to much of anything. I, you know... They'll get distracted even in Snap. Anyway, um, the game is played over, not surprisingly, the Tokaido Road in Japan, which connected uh, Kyoto to Ido, which is Tokyo. Um, it It's basically... Hang on. In the instructions, it'll tell me about the history. Here we go. The Tokaido Road, which dates back to the 11th century, connects the two most important cities in Japan, Ido, today called Tokyo, and Kyoto. It's 500 kilometers long and follows the southern coast of the biggest island in the Japanese archipelago. Is that how you say it? Honshu. Travelers in the 17th century took approximately two weeks to complete the route, usually on foot, sometimes on horse, horseback, and more rarely in litters. I wouldn't recommend playing the board game on horseback or litters, but it's also not going to take two weeks, so I wouldn't worry. Uh, there were 53 stages to the route, and a number of inns were located along the road where travellers could rest and stock up on supplies. The road and inns inspired a bunch of artists, blah, blah, blah. There's, there's a whole bunch of history to the road, and they've done a really good job of replicating that in the game. You've got very Japanese things. You've um, got Japanese-style shops, hot springs. You meet travellers. You stop at inns and consume... Um, dishes etc etc it's a point based game so basically the goal is to get from the start to the end of the route um, and whoever has the most points at the end of the game is the winner but I'll turn the camera down show you how to set up the game show you how to uh, play the game and then hopefully Lily will join me and we'll play a demo game for you so you can see how it goes Okay, so the first thing you're going to want to do is to set up the playing area, the board, the stacks of cards, the money, give everyone their characters, etc, etc. It may look a little bit daunting at first, but rest assured, it is very straightforward, very simple. There's a fantastic user guide that's got lots of pictures um, and, and dot point answers to, to how to do everything. You'll pick it up in no time. Um, it's very simple, and we're going to run through it all anyway. I'll just move this back so we've got a bit of room. So the first thing I'm going to do is grab all these cards. First ones I'm going to put out are called achievement cards. These are worth bonus points at the end of the game. There are two types of achievement cards. Sorry, they're not all worth points at the end of the game. There are two types of achievement cards. These ones with the blue back and these ones with the yellow back. The yellow back are just placed face down and the blue, uh, blue back cards correlate to these paintings here and are placed face up. The reason it's done like that is that these achievement points are awarded at the end of the game. They're things like who had the most encounters, who had the most value um, food, who vid visited the hot springs the most, and who purchased the most souvenirs. So you won't know them until the end of the game. These ones are awarded when people complete paintings. We'll go into that again later. Um, but they're awarded during the game. So they're face up so that people can grab them as soon as they're the first person to complete that achievement. Next, what you're going to want to do is grab all these cards, sort them into the appropriate piles and shuffle them. So the first one I've got here is Hot Springs. Then we've got Encounters, so people you encounter on the road. Uh, the Souvenir Cards. And the food cards. And as you can see, they've all got appropriately marked spaces on the board. Same goes for the uh, paintings. These are paintings that you do while traveling uh, as you're inspired on your journey. These all sit over here. And it's interesting to note, one of the things I love about the, the design of games like this, you probably can't see, but underneath here, I'll, I'll explain that later on when we get to paintings. Then you take all the coins, and obviously, just 
put them somewhere nearby as the, the bank, if you like. And then each player selects a person, a score token, and a coloured, um, what's I'm going to call it? Character marker. Players are then given, at random, two of these traveller tiles. These indicate, they're basically your character for this game, and each of them comes with individual perks. So you shuffle them, give two to each player, and then, one don't fit properly in this box, which is a bit of a nuisance. I can put that aside now. And then each player turns over the character card and decides which of these perks they want to have. Now sometimes the perks on the card are a little bit hard to understand, but luckily the um, instruction manual covers it quite nicely. So for example, the green player has Kinko, who... Each meal card purchase costs one coin less. One coin meals are therefore free. So that means every time you go to an inn and you purchase a meal, you get a discount. And uh, Mitsukuni, who is... Here. Mitsukuni the old man. Mitsukuni earns one additional point for each hot spring card and each achievement card he gets. So whenever he gets an achievement instead of three points, he'll get four. If he has a hot spring card worth two points, he'll get three, etc, etc. So um, the other thing to note is up in the corner here, uh, Mitsukuni starts with six coins and Kinko starts with seven. So if I'm the green player, say I want the extra achievement points rather than cheap meals, I would choose this player, put my token in the corner to indicate that I've chosen that. Say, yellow player chooses this one. These other cards go back in the box. Both players place their scoring tokens at the start on zero. Now, this is a game where you score as you play. Unlike games like, uh, say, Ticket to Ride, where I always forget to add on the score, you get to the end of the game, at least you can go back, count all your trains, count your um, tickets, all that sort of stuff, and figure out your score. If you don't count as you go in this game, you're going to get to the end, and it's almost impossible to go back and see where you were. So, what you do is you put those two there, and then each player takes their starting money. So, yellow gets five coins... And green gets six. There are also special rules. If you're playing in a two-player game, you actually assign a third player. Um, I won't go into the details of how that works now. I'll come back to that later because it might be a bit confusing without understanding how the game works. But... It's important to note when you're doing it, if you're doing a two-player game, add an extra person, put their, their token and their thing on the start alongside everyone else, give them money, etc, etc. Actually, let's pretend we're playing with three players for now. Okay, the next step you do is you randomly put the characters at the first inn in Kyoto, like so. Each one takes up one of these five squares here, um, and the order that they're in is important to when they can move. Turn order in Takedo is a little different to a normal game. It's not sequential, it's determined by your position on the road to um, Ido. So, the way it works is the person who is furthest back gets to move first. So in this case, yellow is the furthest back, so they move to there. Now purple is the furthest back, so they say move to there. Green is the furthest back, they move to there. Now green is the furthest back again, so they immediately get another turn. Sometimes you'll see there are double spaces, such as here. If yellow was the first one to arrive at this double space, then they go on the, the marker closest to the road. Now, if you're in two to three player games, you ignore these second spaces. If you're in a, play, uh, a game of three to, what is it, five? Three to five, then the second person to arrive actually goes there, which is considered furthest away from the route to, to Edo. So that person would go next. So if that person was there, they could go there. 
go again and go there, then this person goes there, etc, etc. It's pretty easy once you get the hang of it, but it's an important thing to take uh, to keep in mind when planning your strategy. You don't want to jump ahead too far because you're going to offer the opportunity for your opponents to spend a lot of time going slowly along and, and racking up a whole bunch of achievement points. When you make a move, you can go as far as you want, but not further than the next inn. Every time you come across an inn, you must wait there for all the other players to arrive. So you can't start the game and immediately go to the end of the game. I don't know why you'd do that anyway. But um, there are benefits to arriving first at the end. Uh, I'll get through uh, that when we get to the inn. But there are distinct disadvantages as well because not only are you sitting there waiting while the others arrive, but you're also going to be last out of the inn for the next thing going forward. But now onto the important stuff, how we make points. Points are earned by basically actioning the various um, points along the road to, to Edo. So you can see they've all got a particular icon, and each icon relates to a particular thing that you can do. I'll run through them now sequentially, uh, starting with souvenirs. So souvenirs, basically what you do is you draw the top three cards from the deck, Oh, it's a terrible, it's terrible for my example, so I'm going to cheat, just pretend I didn't do that, um, and do that. So you can see on the card, there's an icon indicating the type of souvenir it is. So these are like curios, and that's a piece of clothing. Um, the coin cost is down here. And the other important thing here are these numbers, which I'll explain in a sec. So say... Um, yellow person has gone to the souvenir shop and they want to buy these two cards, they can purchase none, one, two or three. It's up to them. Um, so if that person wanted to buy those, they would pay four coins to the bank and they would immediately score what those cards are worth. This card goes to the bottom of the pile. I'll keep it out for the moment though to show you as an example. Clothing. Food. Right. So the way you score these cards is, it's like set building, but it's not like other games where it's a little bit different. So, as you can see, there are four different types of souvenir. Food, fans, clothing, and curios. The way it works is the first one of a set that you get, a set is four different icons, is worth one point. If I bought two things um, of the same type, curio, then that will be worth one point, that will be worth one point. Uh, player two would, uh, player two. Yellow player would get two points. If they had bought these two, however, the first card in the set is worth one point. The second card in the set is worth three points, so they would have got four for that double. If they bought a third card in the set, that's worth five, which brings us up to nine. And of course, if they bought a set of four, they get another seven points. So that's 16 points all up. 16? Yes, 16 points. I mean, you can't buy three in one go anyway, but that's how sets work. So just to refresh, each of the first cards in the set is worth one point. The second card is worth three. Third card is worth five. Fourth card is worth seven, and you apply those points to your score immediately. Give him a coin back. So say he bought those two um, things. He'd get one point for the first, three for the second, so that would be worth four points. And that would be the end of the yellow turn. The next space on the board is the temple. When stopping at a temple, a player is, is this green, is able to donate between one and three coins. So if you stop there, you must donate one coin to the temple, but you can donate up to three. Each coin you donate is worth a point. So that person will get three, um, 
victory points, I guess you call them. Anyway, that person would get three points for that. And at the end of the game, the person who has the most uh, coins donated to the temple gets a bonus of ten. Next person gets seven, four, and two. So it pays to donate to the temple. If you didn't have any money, you're not allowed to stop at the temple because there's a minimum donation of one coin. So you're not allowed to go there. You'd have to go on to the next. But let's say that Green has decided to stop and donate three coins. The next icon is the encounter icon. These are very, very straightforward. You basically draw the top card and then do what it says. Um, there are, I believe, five types of card. The first one is Samurai, where you get three points. Kuge, you get three coins. Anaibato, you get a painting of the colour indicated there. Maybe that's it. I thought there was another one. Oh, Shokunan, uh, he lets you take the top souvenir. And Miko, she allows you to, uh, oh sorry, she will donate, I believe, on your behalf. Let me just quickly check. Yes, on your behalf, so you take one coin out of the bank and donate it to the temple. So you get the point for that, and obviously you get a free coin in effect. So you basically just draw the top card and play the effects. So in this case, the purple person gets three coins. No points for that round, but a nice stash of money. The next three icons here are... Sorry, not three. The next icon there, there, and there directly relate to these paintings. So say it was yellow's turn, and they move to this green icon here. What that would allow them to do is take the first painting card and place it down on the table. Now that is worth one point for yellow for the first card. The second one is worth two points. And the third one is worth three points. And if the person... If the person manages to collect all three cards, they will complete the painting. You can see a slight border around the edge um, to indicate that you've completed it. This has got three cards, that one's got four, and that one's got five. Um, if you're the first person to complete it, you also get an achievement. So you get a bonus three points as being the first person to complete that um, painting. This is what I was alluding to earlier when I said that the design of the board's really helpful. Underneath, um, I'm not sure if you can see, I'll, I'll superimpose a photo, but underneath this, um, underneath each card, there are some small rectangles to say there's three rectangles there, four there, and five there. So you know how many um, pieces are in each of the paintings. So to refresh, when you land on that, you get to take the next one in your, in your set. Um, if you have completed the painting already, you can't stop and paint it again. You, you only collect it once. Once you've done it, you can't stop on there. Same as you can't stop at the temple if, um, if you don't have any money. So that's the green painting there. That's this uh, snowy mountain painting. And that's the blue ocean painting there. The next one is Hot Springs. These are the simplest cards in the game and are purely just worth points, two or three points. That one's worth two, so green gets two points. Another simple one, say the purple person didn't want to stop and pick up a, uh, a, a mountain painting, they go to here. This means that they're going to do some work, so <laughs> obviously um, purple's saving up for something, so they get three coins for working at the farm. And there's no limit to the amount of money you can have, other than the amount that are in the game. So, I don't know why you save up that much, but I guess if you're playing five players, theoretically you could run out. I don't know what happens when you do that. If anyone knows, let me know. And that's basically it for the, the normal moves. That covers all the different things that you'll encounter on your journey. The last thing that'll happen is when you all reach the inn, you all stop and have the opportunity to have a meal. You draw four meal cards, Correction, you draw one more meal card than there are players. We're playing a three-player game, so we draw 
four meal cards. The person who's at the front, in this case purple, gets to look at them first. So there are two of them worth uh, that cost two coins, one that costs three coins, and one that costs one coin. All meals are worth six achievement points. Achievement points? Not achievement points. Six points. Um, and you don't have to purchase a meal if you don't want to. The purple person gets to choose first. So let's say they've been saving a lot of money, so they decide to buy the one worth uh, three. They then pass that. You don't show that to people when you're choosing. You pass that to the next person, green. They decide not to buy anything. They pass it to yellow, who can't afford anything. And all the rest are discarded on this spot beside here. Now, the reason you might choose to have... Um, a more expensive meal rather than a cheap one, if you can afford it, is because there's an achievement here at the end of the game for the person, so you'll get three points are awarded to the person who spent the most money on food at ends. Once everyone's purchased their food, placed it in front of them, given themselves the points, then it's time to set forth on the next stage of your journey. So the person at the back goes first, so on, so on, until you get to the next in. You draw another four mil cards, so on and so forth, all the way to the end of the game. And when you reach the end of the game, there are a few things to do before declaring a winner. Although usually it's pretty clear who the winner is at that point. All these um, achievements will have been given to players for their various um, completion of the, the paintings, panoramas, that sort of thing. And then the first thing you're going to do is add up all the donations. So in this instance, green donated three, so they get an extra 10 points. No one else donated anything, so they don't get any points. Um, and we go through the achievements. First one, who spent the most money on food? That was purple player, who will say. Uh, wherever, purple player, wherever purple player is, that's it, so they get a bonus three. The next one is who, stop, uh, who had the most encounters. Let's say that was, I don't know, I think, I can't remember who did it. Whoever had the most encounters gets three. Whoever has the most hot springs cards gets three. And whoever collected the most souvenirs, not the most value, the most in number. If there are a tie for any of those four achievement cards, both players get three points. So, that's a pretty good deal. And that same rule, sorry, I should have said applies with the temple. So, if um, purple and green had both donated the same amount, they'd both get 10 points. Now, the only other thing I wanted to explain was the rule if there are two players. So, if you're playing a two-player game, as mentioned at the start... Uh, where are we? So if you're playing a two-player game, you assign your characters and your money as normal. Five for that person. Put your pieces there. And then what you do is you randomly pick a card, put the thing in there, give that character starting coins, put their piece here like so, shuffle them all, Put them at random and that person is considered to be a, a neutral player and it really plays into the strategy that makes for a very different two-player game to a um uh you know game with more players now that that this is a rule that i actually don't play with the kids when i'm playing um like when i'm playing just with my daughter we'll just play normal rules because it's a little bit too complex but it's very simple um if you're playing and you're, yeah, well, if you want to play it. So, the way it works is, say the yellow person moves there. Now the, oh, sorry, green person moves there. Now the green person is the furthest forward on the uh, thing. So they are able to move the purple person. So they move the purple person there. And make them donate one coin. Now the yellow person moves here. Now it's the purple person's turn again. Green person is furthest forward, so the green person moves it there. 
Then the yellow person moves there. Purple person's turn. Um, yellow person is now furthest forward on the track, so they determine where the purple person goes. Now, you don't really want the purple person to win, obviously, um, so they're not going to be buying stuff and, and, and all that sort of thing, but it's a very useful tool for moving your character forward and being able to block someone else from uh, getting something. Say you notice that... Uh, the other player is close to completing one of the panoramas. You can move the neutral player, move yourself too far forward, then move the neutral player to block them from completing that panorama, which might give you the opportunity to complete it yourself before them, get the achievement and the bonus points. It's a pretty cool rule. Um, you don't have to play it, but you are meant to for two players, and it, it really does make for a, a much more strategic game. And that's basically it. Hope you uh, liked the video. If you enjoy the game, let me know. I absolutely love the game, as I mentioned. Um, it's a lot of fun. Not sure why. It's very simple, very straightforward, but it's just fun to play. It looks beautiful. The cards are beautiful. Really good game. Thanks for watching. See you later.